In the second week of October, the war in Ukraine went back to mainly being a war of attrition. Battles raged and much equipment and infrastructure was destroyed, but neither side gained decisive ground in this period. Instead, the information space was dominated by damaging airstrikes on Ukraine, more weapon supplies to both sides, significant mobilization-related problems in Russia, the upcoming winter, and the problems it will cause, directly and indirectly, to actors of this war. In this video, we'll talk about these topics and more. Firstly, let's describe the situation on the battlefield. On the Hirsan front, the front line remained relatively stable amidst speculations on the ongoing or impending withdrawal of the Russian forces and pro-Russian administration from the right bank of the Dnipro. Throughout this period, the Russian military bloggers claimed that the Ukrainian army had been trying to break through the Russian defensive line established early in October, following another retreat of the Russian military. Such claims were made on October 19th, 20th, 21st, 26th and 28th. Russian sources admitted a minor Ukrainian advance in an unnamed sector on October 21st, but argued that the Russian army easily repulsed all the other attempts with high losses for Ukraine. There was an independent report of the advance of the Ukrainian 60th Infantry Brigade on Piatikatki, which seems like the most notable territorial gain they made in this period and does not indicate a significant breakthrough. The Ukrainian command continues the policy of silence regarding the situation on the battlefield. The Ukrainians have likely engaged in several probing attacks on the front line in Kherson Oblast, which has become narrower and better defended by the Russian troops. Still, reports of significant losses are probably just another piece of Russian propaganda. These probing attacks aim to find a weak spot in the Russian defenses, which Ukraine failed to do in the second half of October. One needs to be aware of the terrain of Kherson Oblast, which is disadvantageous for the attacking side. This area is dominated by flat fields and small rivers and does not have much tree line or elevation. Hence it is difficult for the attacking side to hide from the defending army. But even these geographic obstacles are unlikely to save the Russian units here from eventually having to surrender or leave the right bank of the Dnipro in the foreseeable future due to problems with supplies caused by continued HIMARS strikes on Russian supply lines, pontoon bridges, concentrations of forces, military bases, ammunition depots and other essential components of the Russian military infrastructure. Many reports related to the Russian withdrawal from Hessen Oblast in this period emerged. The Ukrainian service of the RFERL concluded that, following the investigation of satellite images, the Russians have stopped sending heavy equipment to the right bank of the Dnipro, while also evacuating some personnel from there. Statements of the new commander of the Russian army in Ukraine, General Sergei Sarovikin, about the necessity to carry out difficult decisions in Kherson and off the head of the Kherson Occupation Administration, Vladimir Saldo, about the evacuation of his administration to the left bank of the Dnipro indicated that indeed Russia has been moving out some of its assets from the threatened area. Sorovikin also accused Ukraine of planning to destroy the Kokovka hydroelectric power plant, which could cause disastrous flooding in the Hessen Oblast. It is unclear how flooding Hessen would serve the Ukrainian goal to liberate its territory in the south, as it would create an additional obstacle for them and delay their potential advance. Still, Russia continues claiming that Ukraine intends to do precisely that. On October 21st, the Ukrainian Southern Command confirmed that Russia was evacuating some of its equipment and personnel to the east bank of the Dnipro, while adding that 2,000 mobilized men were sent to defend the front line in Hessen Oblast. On the following day, Saldo ordered all civilians to evacuate Hessen. Some speculated that these moves and the Russian rhetoric indicated that Russia had decided to withdraw from the right bank of the Dnipro but as of the end of October, this has not happened. Moreover, on October 24th, the chief of Ukrainian military intelligence, Kirilo Budinov, confirmed that Russia planned to continue fighting in the Hessen Oblast, despite withdrawing some of its assets from the region. At this point, the Russian command intends to maintain the much narrower front line with the help of the mobilized soldiers and prepared defensive positions to inflict as many losses as possible on Ukraine. Ukrainian intelligence confirmed that Russia had kept some of its most capable units in the Hessen Oblast. Social media footage and reports of pro-Russian bloggers 
show that the 126th Coastal Defense Brigade, the 83rd Guards Air Assault Brigade, the 11th Guards Air Assault Brigade, and other experienced units are still operating in Hezen Oblast, and there's no indication that they intend to withdraw without fighting. Furthermore, the advisor of the Ukrainian presidential administration, Alexei Arestovich, claimed that the Hessian front is developing in the negative direction, as Russia has deployed six additional BTGs from the Zaporizhian front to the right bank of the Dnipro, in preparation for a counter-offensive. On October 30th, one of the chiefs of the Hessian occupation administration, Kirill Stremosov, revealed that Russia was building defensive positions in Belozerka and Chonobayevka, very close to the city of Hessian. Statements related to the situation on the Hezan front contradict each other, as the construction of defensive positions and the preparation for a counter-offensive are unlikely to occur simultaneously. Sources claim that the Russians had achieved parity in terms of numbers. Still, the Ukrainians maintained their fire advantage due to the precision weapons the West provided and the diminished Russian supplies. Even though the Ukrainian forces continued to advance slowly, not much changed on the Svatova front either. It is worth reminding that at this point, the main target of the Ukrainian army here is to take the PO7 and P66 highways under their control, and eventually move on to Starobilsk, another crucial logistical hub supplying Russian units in North Luhansk. Losing Svatova and Starobilsk would mean the eventual withdrawal from North Luhansk. It is indicative that this is where the Wagner company has been rumored to build a defensive line since September. As of October 22nd, a two-kilometer-long defensive structure consisting of four rows of anti-tank pyramids and a trench behind them has been constructed in the vicinity of Hirska. It is assumed that landmines have been placed between the pyramids. According to the RIA-FAN media outlet of Russia, this defensive line will eventually stretch to about 217 kilometers, going roughly from Kremina to just north of the city of Luhansk. Russia still controls a vast area north of the city of Luhansk, but this defensive line will not protect it. But it is the area that will be under grave threat if Russia loses Fatova and Starobilsk. Wagner's sponsor, Yevgeny Prigozhin, used this topic to make another thinly veiled sarcastic comment about the state of the Russian army, saying that this line would help the Russian armed forces to hide behind Wagner's backs. For the time being, Russia has averted catastrophe on this front and has maintained its line from Svatova to Kremina, primarily by plugging holes with untrained mobilized troops, but they have lost some ground to the Ukrainians. From October 23rd to 25th, the 92nd Mechanized Brigade liberated Miasozhirivka, and the 25th Airborne Brigade pushed elements of the 2nd Motor Rifle Division from Kamazinivka. In the southern section of this front, the 10th Mountain Assault Brigade liberated Zolotarivka, while likely the 66th Separate Mechanized Brigade regained Novosadova and Nevska. This was followed by a further advance of the 92nd Mechanized Brigade on the Northern Front to liberate Kovalivka and to advance on Novoselovska on October 26th to 27th. The Russians attempted several counterattacks, particularly in the southern section of this front, where Wagner units were sent to bolster the front line, but reportedly failed to push back the Ukrainian units. While the Russian front has not collapsed in North Luhansk by any stretch, it is under heavy pressure, particularly in the northern section of the front, where the Ukrainians have claimed to take the Kremina Svatova road under fire control. On the Zaporizhian front, more of the same continued. Artillery battles went on, but they did not lead to any visible change on the ground. Russian military bloggers continued informing about the deployment of additional Ukrainian troops to this front. This has been an ongoing theme for the past several months. Towards the end of the month, pro-Russian sources claimed the Russian 810th Naval Infantry Brigade broke through to reach the southern outskirts of Pavlivka, but this has not been confirmed by independent sources or video footage. In contrast, pro-Ukrainian forces refer to footage demonstrating the destruction of Russian vehicles trying to advance in this direction. The most intense battles in the second half of October took place on the Donbass front. Wagner units and DPR forces attempted to break the Ukrainian defenses from Solodar to Marienka, with the 93rd Mechanized Brigade and newly deployed units, like the 62nd Mechanized Brigade, engaging in valiant defense along the whole front line against Russian attacks. 
Russia largely continued frontal assaults, causing heavy losses on both sides. According to Prigozhin, Wagnerites managed to advance only 100 to 200 meters a day, which is inadequate to the degree of losses the mercenaries suffer. Wagner's military capabilities should not be exaggerated, as now the bulk of its forces consist of former inmates. Wagner is also among the best equipped forces fighting against Ukraine, thanks to the sponsorship of the billionaire Prigozhin. The biggest gain of the Russian army on this front was north of Donetsk airport, where a Russian mechanized unit broke through to the outskirts of Vodyana. Apparently, the Ukrainian defenders managed to stop the further advance, but it is unclear whether they regained the lost positions. The purpose of this offensive is to cut Avdivka, a critical Ukrainian stronghold on this front, from the west. Another notable battle was around the asphalt plant on the outskirts of Bakhmut, initially occupied by the Russians, before the Ukrainian troops regained it. In less than two days, the Ukrainians liberated the outskirts of Bakhmut, which the Wagnerites were able to take over two months. Still, this area remains contested. Russia also advanced to the outskirts of Zelenopilia, to the town of Kleshchivka, and to the outskirts of Novomikhailivka. The situation around Avdivka, Marienka, Pervomyska, Bakhmutska, Novomikhailivka, Nevelsa, and Mayorsk is very tense, with Russia attempting to advance and Ukraine standing its ground. Belarus continues to be an important factor in the Russo-Ukrainian war. In the previous video, we reported on controversial events related to a military buildup in Belarus. Speculations are being made related to another potential attack from Belarus by the joint Russian-Belarusian force on Kyiv. On October 16th to 17th, information on the deployment of Russian troops and military equipment was reported. According to the official of the Belarusian Ministry of Defense, Valery Ravenko, Belarus has welcomed or will welcome 9,000 Russian troops, along with the deployment of 400 Russian tanks and armored vehicles, up to 100 artillery pieces, and an unspecified number of military aircraft within the framework of the regional grouping of forces. The Ukrainian general staff claimed Russia continued using Belarusian airspace to launch missile and drone attacks on Ukraine. There are reports of the deployment of S-300 and S-400 systems close to the Ukrainian border as well. These reports further fueled speculation about preparations for another attack on North Ukraine from Belarus. For now, military analysts argue that the Belarusian army is weak and does not stand much chance of succeeding with the Russian army if they indeed decide to invade Ukraine. The Russian military failed to take Kyiv and even enter the capital after weeks of bloody battles at the time when it was at its strongest. Furthermore, the Ukrainian army is much more experienced and much better equipped at the moment. The potential success of the regional grouping of forces against the Ukrainian military is unlikely if they decide to attack Kyiv. But even if the regional grouping of forces is not going to attack Ukraine, its mere presence on the border will force the Ukrainian army to keep a considerable force in the north to prevent any potential incursion. For instance, on October 26th, Russia attacked the border town of Tenova to fix at least some Ukrainian units north of Kharkiv to prevent their use on the front lines. On October 24th, the Belarusian Gayan Monitoring Group reported that Belarus withdrew most of its military equipment earlier deployed to the border back to their bases, indicating that, at the very least, the invasion from Belarus is not likely in the immediate future. Now let's talk about the leading weapon supplier of Russia at the moment, Iran. Despite Iran's denials of the provisions of weapons to Russia, reports about more weapon supplies emerged. On October 16th, the Washington Post claimed that Iran is planning to give Fateh-110 and Zulfagar short-range ballistic missiles, along with Shahed-136, Mohejar-6 and Arash-2 drones. It looks like Russia will continue to rely on Iran as its chief ally and weapon supplier, as long as Tehran can provide those weapons. Moreover, the New York Times reported that Iranian instructors are in Crimea, training Russians on using its drones, or possibly even operating some of them. Ukrainian media later claimed that the Ukrainian strikes killed 10 Iranian instructors, but provided no evidence. During this period, Russia continued to use Iranian drones and its own missiles to target the critical civilian infrastructure of Ukraine. 
on October 17th, 18th, 22nd, 24th and 31st, Russia attacked Kyiv, Odessa, Jotomir, Kharkiv, Krivoyri, Zaporizhia, Vinnytsia, Sumy, Dnipro, Mykolaiv, Volyn, Rivna and other cities, heavily damaging the Ukrainian electricity infrastructure. On October 18th, President Zelensky stated that Russian attacks had destroyed 30% of the Ukrainian power stations. Russia has several goals in mind with the attacks on the Ukrainian infrastructure. First, heavy damage to the Ukrainian electricity infrastructure promises a difficult and cold winter for Ukrainian citizens. Putin hopes this will demoralize ordinary Ukrainians and push Zelensky to negotiate with him. At this point, this looks extremely unlikely. Second, Russia is successfully diminishing the stockpile of Ukrainian surface-to-air missiles. Ukraine is forced to use more expensive air defense weapons to prevent cheap Shahed drones from hitting their critical infrastructure. On the other hand, Russia is also quickly expending its limited supply of cruise missiles. According to the Ukrainian military intelligence chief, Krylo Budinov, Russia possesses only 13% of their pre-war Eskandar arsenal, 43% of caliber, 45% of KH-101 and KH-555. For instance, on October 31st only, Russia fired more than 50 KH-101 and KH-555 missiles on Ukraine. Sanctions impede Russia from manufacturing more cruise missiles as quickly as it would have wanted. So in the foreseeable future, we will see if the diminishing supply of missiles will affect the Russian military strategy. Let's talk a little bit more about the October 31st attack, since it was a retaliation to another symbolic win by Ukraine in this war. In the wee hours of October 29th, Ukraine attacked the Sevastopol harbor, hosting several naval assets of the Russian Black Sea Fleet. Nine UAVs and seven autonomous maritime drones were used to heavily damage the Admiral Makarov frigate, which became the flagship of the Russian Black Sea Fleet following the sinking of Moskva. Several more Russian ships were damaged or sunk in this attack. Russia immediately blamed Ukraine for a terrorist attack on its navy, in conjunction with British intelligence. How striking an enemy ship during a war is a terrorist attack is beyond our comprehension. Still, Russia retaliated with the above-mentioned October 31st strikes on Ukraine, and by leaving the grain deal earlier brokered by the UN and Turkey. But in a fascinating turn of events, Ukraine and two mediators agreed to continue shipping Ukrainian grain to the international markets. Marine traffic confirmed that on October 31st, 12 Ukrainian ships carrying grain left ports. Heavy damage to the Russian Black Sea Fleet and the inability to bring vessels into the Black Sea due to the Montreux Convention have severely weakened the Russian positions in the Black Sea. It seems like Turkey is confident enough to take on the Russian Black Sea Fleet at this point, and looks to expand its global influence by insisting on continuing the Ukrainian grain exports. For now, Russia has not meaningfully reacted to this development except pledging to supply 500,000 tons of grain to the poorest countries. In early November, Russia declared that it was renewing its participation in the grain deal, like anyone asked. Western allies continued supporting Ukraine with more weapons, money, training and intelligence during this period. Due to the intensification of the air threat by Russia, this time the focus was on anti-air defense systems. France pledged Kratal surface-to-air missile systems, Germany provided TRML-4D radars and Iris-T systems. Spain donated all of its Spada 2000 and two-thirds of its Hawk PIP-3 air defense systems. This significantly increased the air defense capability of Ukraine and enabled it to do a better job defending against Russian missiles and drones. Despite Israeli Defense Minister Benny Gantz's statement about Israel's rejection of providing air defense systems to Ukraine, the Israeli military intelligence portal Debka claimed that Israel has provided smart shooter systems to Ukraine to fight Iranian drones. Unconfirmed rumors state that Israel destroyed several Iranian drone factories in Syria during this period. The EU foreign policy chief Josep Borrell indicated that Europe would raise its military assistance to 3.1 billion euros and launch the EU military training mission for Ukraine, headed by the Polish general Piotr Trytek. Furthermore, Sweden intends to transfer 12 archer artillery systems. Italy has donated 20 to 30 155mm self-propelled Otto Malara M109L howitzers. 
Slovenia has provided 28 M55S tanks. Germany has given two more Mars II systems and four Panzerhobitzer 2000 artillery systems to Ukraine, while the US announced yet another security package for Ukraine, providing HIMARS missiles, artillery ammunition, anti-armor mine systems, Humvees, and so on, worth $275 million. An interesting tidbit regarding the losses came from Forbes, as its report claimed that the 11th Army Corps, which is in charge of the defense of Kaliningrad, and is considered among the elite of the Russian army, lost up to half its soldiers and hardware, mostly during the Kharkiv counteroffensive. This corps was long viewed by the NATO leadership as the unit that would spearhead a possible invasion of the Baltics, and its horrific losses show that Poland and the Baltic states are investing their military budgets well by helping Ukraine so much. Putin hopes the cold winter will destabilize Western countries and topple pro-Ukrainian governments, forcing them to stop supporting Ukraine. But the EU and European governments have managed this potentially critical situation well. According to the EU, the European gas storages are 94% full, and every EU member state has filled their gas storage to at least 80%, apart from Hungary and Latvia, whose gas storages are only half full. As a result, gas prices have dropped significantly. Ships carrying LNG are waiting in European ports to unload their cargo, which even caused gas prices to drop below zero for a while. Europe seems ready for winter, as Russian blackmail is not working so far. Russia has made another very dubious claim, probably to seed confusion in the Western coalition, by stating that Ukraine is preparing to use a dirty bomb. Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu called his colleagues in the US, UK, France and Turkey to inform them about this claim. Russia has not brought any evidence to back this claim, and American and British defense ministers dismissed this. Funnily enough, Russia continues its rhetoric about biolabs, dirty bombs and infected mosquitoes all being developed in Ukraine. How mosquitoes can discern between Russian and Ukrainian soldiers remains a mystery at the time of writing this script. Of course, Russian partial mobilization and Putin's steps to somehow turn the tide in the war remains an important story. On October 19th, Putin declared martial law in the recently annexed territories of Ukraine, an intermediate response level in Crimea and in border regions. This has allowed Putin to order the creation of territorial defense forces in the annexed territories, possibly forcing Ukrainians under Russian occupation to fight against their own country. On October 28th, Putin and Shoigu announced the end of mobilization. Shoigu stated that 300,000 men were mobilized, and 82,000 were already in Ukraine. Mobilization was declared to come to an end, possibly due to the start of the autumn conscript cycle in Russia, which was rescheduled to November 1st. Conscription will allow Russia to send fresh recruits to Ukraine outside of the mobilization framework. A Russian telegram channel referred to sources in the Russian Ministry of Defense and claimed that as of October 28th, 692,843 men were mobilized, 340,000 of whom have already been sent to Ukraine and border regions. Another Russian telegram channel contended that instead of sending the mobilized men to bolster battered but existing units, the Russian command is creating new units consisting of mobilized men from scratch it would make much more sense to send the mobilized into the ranks of experienced and trained soldiers and let them gather experience there. Moreover, it is reported that the Russian command has not come up with a standardized training program for the mobilized, and it is up to their commander of their unit. Russia also continued allowing Prigozhin to recruit inmates to Wagner. According to Galagu.net, a human rights project, more than 10,000 inmates have already been recruited to fight in Ukraine. Furthermore, foreign policy reported that Russia is attempting to recruit members of the Afghan National Army Commando Corps, trained by American and British armies, to fight within the Wagner ranks. It is worth monitoring this process, since Afghan commandos are capable soldiers. Still, we don't think that they would join Russian ranks for various reasons, chief of them being that Russia is trying to maintain a good relationship with the Taliban regime. In this period, Russia also suffered two setbacks on its soil. On October 17th, an Su-34 crashed into a residential building in Yeysk after the pilot lost control of the aircraft. Thirteen people were killed as a result. On October 31st, 
Ukrainian saboteurs completed another daring mission deep behind enemy lines in Zikov by destroying two Ka-52 helicopters on a Russian airfield. While these two events do not significantly impact the battlefield, they will further degrade the Russian people's trust in the Russian army and its commanders. Russia continued shuffling its commanders and heavily criticized Colonel General Alexander Lapin was reportedly replaced by Lieutenant General Andrei Mordvachev as the commander of the Central Military District as of October 30th. Kedirov and Prigozhin heavily criticized Lapin, and sources claim that Mordvachev is very friendly with Kedirov. Putin continues promoting a siege mentality in Russia by regularly declaring that Russia is fighting with NATO. Of course, it is easier to justify problems on the battlefield in the war against mighty NATO, not so much against Ukraine, which was supposed to fall in three days. In his speeches, Putin again accused Ukraine of being a NATO vassal and made an outrageous comment about Russia being the single real guarantee of Ukrainian sovereignty. But Putin's circle is far from a monolith at this point, as some of the key supporters of the war continue criticizing the conduct of the war in Ukraine. For instance, Ramzan Kedarov called to erase Ukrainian cities from the earth in response to a Ukrainian strike on the military base hosting Chechen units in Kherson Oblast. He publicly stated his discontent with Russia's weak response to some of the Ukrainian attacks. Kedarov also engaged in jihadi rhetoric, which inevitably raised eyebrows among Russian nationalist circles. Kedarov and Prigozhin are leveraging their exploits in the war in Ukraine, and so far, Putin has turned a blind eye to their criticism. October was another successful month for Ukraine, as it continued its advance on the Hassan and North Luhansk fronts. Ukraine liberated approximately 2,500 square kilometers in October, despite losing ground on the Donbass front. But the season of muddy terrain is here, and the pace of advance on either side will likely drop significantly. According to the senior research fellow at King's College, Mike Martin, the Ukrainian style of warfare is built around maneuver, which requires speed and agility. Both of these are far more difficult to achieve in winter. The same is even more true for a heavier and poorly equipped Russian army. While in theory, winter in Ukraine is a more advantageous period for offensives, due to the freezing of the terrain and numerous small rivers, cold sub-zero temperatures may slow down both sides due to reasons like increased malfunction of equipment more precipitation leading to poor visibility for drones and aircraft, and so on. As of November 2nd, according to Oryx blog, the visually confirmed losses on both sides are as follows. For Russia, they are 1,420 tanks, 3,001 vehicles, 184 command posts and communication stations, 25 heavy mortars, 454 artillery pieces and vehicles, 146 multiple rocket launchers, 63 aircraft, 57 helicopters, and 147 drones. For Ukraine, they are 340 tanks, 972 vehicles, 7 command posts and communication stations, 154 artillery pieces and vehicles, 29 multiple rocket launchers, 55 aircraft, 22 helicopters, and 48 drones. We're going to continue covering the illegal and unprovoked Russian invasion of Ukraine in the coming weeks. So make sure to subscribe and press the bell button to see it. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps us immensely. Our videos would be impossible to produce without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links down in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.